All right, we'll do, we'll do a short recap uh, for those who weren't here last time. We're in, um, well, we, we started uh, Mark 2, chapter 2, and when we stopped at verse 17. So this is in a timeline. Uh, Mark 2 is uh, the same timeline as about Luke 4. Uh, Jesus, he came out of the wilderness full of Holy Spirit and power. And he, did a lot, uh, uh, he cleanses the temple, and that's in, in the Gospel of John. The first time, he cleanses the temple two times. Um, and he does a lot of miracles in Jerusalem. He does a lot of healings. Then he meets a couple of the apostles that you can read in the Gospel of John. It's um, in, a, in a few chapters in the beginning. And then he goes to Capernaum. Now, he makes Capernaum his headquarters. That's where he's situated. And that's where his main ministry is going to go on for some time. So in Capernaum, now there him everywhere because power was being released through him, and he was casting out devils in the synagogues again in the general area of Capernaum and um, all those cities that are around the lake, the lake. So then we talked about where there were so many people that these four friends they brought a paralytic man and they brought him down through the roof remember yeah. they couldn't break in yeah. but they really cared about the friend and Jesus out of their faith I mean he heals the paralytic and he exposes and we start kind of seeing what the leadership because there were some Pharisees there were some scribes watching what he was doing and they get offended when he forgives his sins because they say well because they know the Bible right this is, these are the Bible teachers of Israel they're leaders of Israel they get offended because they say that's blasphemy. In fact, they don't even say it. They think it. And Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, perceives it. He knows exactly what they're thinking in their hearts. And so he says, all right, if you don't think I, I have the right to uh, forgive sins, because they say only God can forgive sins out of all. He says, gives them this question, um, you know, uh, what's easier to forgive sins or to have the man get up and walk? Well, of course, it is easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't really tell you know, if something happened or not, didn't happen. How are you going to verify, right? But for him to get up, a person that never walked before, that's a, that takes power of God. So he says, I will prove you that I have authority and power to forgive sins. I'm going to make this man walk. And he does that. And it's a miracle. Not and the fact that he gets healed, that he actually walks. A person that does not walk, that doesn't just start walking right away because there's therapy, has to go through and learn how to walk. This guy just gets up and the, by the power of God, he's walking and everybody's astonished. So his crowds increase. And then we talked about that Jesus actually, after he ministered to them, he would find time to go into prayer. And again, that's a very interesting moment. We kind of discussed that, how important it is to have personal prayer. Now think of what is Jesus has been fully God. He always would commune with His Father. I mean, like, like, why do you need to pray, Jesus? I mean, you are God. You are so close to your Father. But in His humanity, He was praying and He was completely relying on the Holy Spirit. All right? So He said, prayer is important to me. In fact, when Peter was looking for Him, he like, hey, Jesus, the revival has to keep going. You know, people are coming. People are waiting for you. They're looking for you. And he says, no, I have new assignments. We've got to go to different villages. We've got to preach the gospel in different places. Jesus was not embarrassed to say no because he did everything out of the will of God, whatever he was his assignment. So, so that's kind of another thing we talked about, that um, when we pray, we uh, have a revelation of the things. We have, we have assignments, all of us, that we have to do. So... So then we um, talked about that he met, he, so he meets Matthew and um, is a tax collector. And uh, he, Matthew, is so happy that Jesus says, hey, Matthew, you want to be on my team? He's like, are you, are you sure? Because he's a rabbi and tax collectors we talked about were like, were like sinners, maybe a little bit below because there were Jewish people working for the Romans. They were oppressing their own people. They were stealing money from their own brothers. So they were hated by the Jewish community. So Jesus says, I want you, Matthew. Would you follow me? He says, thank you, Jesus. He, he's so happy, he throws a party. 
well, that really gets the leadership angry. They don't like that, and they're complaining to the disciples, why is Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, right? And then we stopped on verse 17 when Jesus heard it. He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said, hey, I came to save people in my first coming as a Messiah. I came to save people. This is the sinners. That's where I'm going to go. Um, he makes that statement that, you know, that he didn't come uh, to, to save the righteous. Well, there's nobody righteous. We're all sinners. So in that sense, it's kind of, uh, even those scribes and Pharisees, they needed Jesus for salvation. But he makes that point that uh, he came for those that seek Him, that need Him, that are broken hearted. So we are in verse 18. So a small recap, maybe not so small, but if somebody missed it, you guys are up to speed. So verse 18. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to Him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now John had disciples. Uh, talks about John the Baptist and the Pharisees just like Jesus had disciples a Pharisee would have people that would follow and learn from them they were a teacher and they were kind of the students they would live with them and they would do what the teacher does and Pharisees and John the Baptist they were very committed they were so zealous and so they were fasting they were doing different things and when people observed the disciples of Jesus, they, they kind of saw that Jesus went, you know, to this house to have a meal. Um, he was eating here. He was eating there. You know, and, and so they were like, hey, why, Jesus, why aren't your disciples are not committed? Like, you know, we have disciples of John, very committed brothers. You have the, you know, disciples of Pharisees, very committed. They're fasting. And Jesus makes this profound statement. And it's a revelation, actually. It's a new revelation that they... At that time, I don't think they could even connect. So he says this. Jesus says to them, um, he's kind of answering the question, and he says, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. This is one of the first times Jesus gives a revelation that there's a bridegroom and there's a bride. Uh, for, for Jewish people, how they relate to God is not in that context. For them, God was Yahweh. He was all-powerful. Um, he was revered. They were afraid of God. They were afraid to sin. They were afraid of the wrath of God. But the revelation of God as a bridegroom, that was radical. I mean, that teaching was completely radical. Well, you have to go all the way to the book of Hosea. Um, if you read the book of Hosea, he talks about this truth. Actually, it's the Old Testament truth. If they would, again, it takes the Holy Spirit to kind of catch that in the Old Testament, where God calls himself husband. And he talks about being betroth betrothed to the people, or betrothed. Yes. Mm -hmm. betrothed. I'm, I'm working on my accent. Betrothed. <laughs> That's the revelation. I mean... They read those scriptures, but they just could not even get that. So he's saying, there's a bridegroom. Of course, he's talking about him. Okay. And there's a bride. Of course, he's talking about his people. And that implies that there's yeah. this relationship. Now, John, in the Gospel of John, calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. That's an interesting... Again, John the Baptist has the revelation by the Holy Spirit. He knows that Jesus is the bridegroom. And he says, he's the bridegroom. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. Well, what does that mean to be a friend of the bridegroom? Well, what I think is, is the person that is committed. It's the person that is an, has this anointing of Elijah the prophet. And their job is is to make sure people get connected to Jesus at the heart level. So their kind of job is to introduce Jesus to people at the heart level and not get in between. You know, the friend of the bridegroom does not jump between the bride and the bridegroom and says, hey, what about me? He doesn't do that. He 
stays back, make sure that the bride is completely focused on Jesus, and then he makes sure there's nothing stands between them. So he says, the reason that uh, my disciples don't fast is because I'm here, because the bridegroom is with them. They are rejoicing. There's joy. There's this dynamic of his presence with them. There is no reason for them to fast. But then he goes on. So in verse 20, he says, but the days will come. Now he's talking about the days when he's going to leave. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And then, then they will fast in those days. He says, a time is coming where, where I'll be taken from them. Of course, we know after the resurrection, he ascended. And because he left them, there's this feeling in their heart that, uh, of loss of the closeness that they had with Jesus before. He says, when that happens, they will go into fasting so that when you fast, you can feel His presence again, closeness. Every time we fast, we feel God's presence closer. You feel Him more in your inner man. So He says, when I leave, they will fast because they will miss me. They will want my presence with them, so they'll go into fasting. So that's kind of what He's talking about. Then he gives a little proverb in verse 21. He says, No one sews a piece, sews, sews, I'm sorry. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But the new wine must be put into the new wineskin. Now, what he's talking about, he's giving them a pro proverb. What is he saying? He says, the legalistic approach that the Jewish people had, you know, the rituals and all those things that they were very, they kind of made sure they, that they did. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes or the, or the new covenantal relationship begins, when the Holy Spirit comes, the old way, the Judaism way of how they did the sacrifices, the, you know, the purifications, the you know, washing things, and then all the things that God talked about in the book of Leviticus. You cannot have both. Because if you're going to have the new, the, new, um, the new ministry of the Holy Spirit that was going to be released after His, after his resur resur uh, resurrection, it's not compatible with the old covenantal um, purification laws. It's just, it's, it's a completely different agreement between God and people through Jesus Christ. So it's, he says, if you try to combine Judaism and, you know, being uh, uh, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to work. It's going to ruin a person. A person cannot combine, try to walk in the Spirit and observe all of the details that are, um, that are in the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and you can read it in the Old Testament. It's not compatible. Why? Because things are different in the Second Covenant. Well, in the Second Covenant is God made covenant not with people, but with His Son. The First Covenant was made on the blood of goats and bulls with people. Because Moses took the blood, you know, he put it into a little dish. He took the hyssop, it's a little bush. And he sprinkled people, and he sprinkled the, the, the Bible, or the, the scrolls of, of the law that he wrote. And he says, this is the covenant between you and God. Now, when there's an agreement, there's two sides, right? They have, you have God says, I will bless you if, and there's conditions, right? And I will curse you if you don't do certain things. There's conditions. Well, guess what? People would always break those conditions. So God would have to come out and punish them for breaking the law. And, you know, you read the book of Exodus, uh, how people murmur, um, and then, you know, snakes appear and start, you know, start um, uh, sting, uh, biting people. And then, or you have a plague would break out because they were disobeying or they were breaking the covenantal relationship by disobeying God. Well, God promised to the prophets that time is coming. As prophet Jeremiah, he says, I will make a new covenant. The time is coming 
well, I will make a new covenant. It's going to be eternal and it's going to be, be between God and Jesus, His Son. Neither side can sin. That's why it's eternal. It can never be broken. God can't sin. Jesus can't sin. It's, it, it's eternal. It cannot be changed. cannot be approved upon. Yeah. Sealed by His very own blood. Not by the blood of goats, of the animals that they had to bring. But the very blood of Jesus Christ sealed it forever for us. So Jesus says, because of that, I am the door. All right? You can be part of the covenant that I've made with my Father on your behalf. Or you don't have to. You can enter in or not. The choice is, is ours. And pe people you know, choose not to enter. And Jesus says, I, I won't judge them. But the time will come when the word will judge them. So the judgment wouldn't come like it would come to the children of Israel. You know, they would mess up and then God would send the armies of the Assyrians and the Babylonians just to chastise his nation because they were covenant breakers. Well, now he says, I won't judge you now. My, I want to save you. I want to give you the choice to go through the door. There's one door. And that's Jesus. No other way. No other door. Um, you can think, you, you know, people say, well, what if, you, what if you do this and do that? There is no other door. There's no other man that is fully God, that is perfect and sinless, that has died for his people. There's nobody, take any religion, nobody died on somebody's behalf and, were, and was resurrected from the dead. So, so the wineskins, what happens is we have to be born again. That is what he's talking about. We have to be born again and filled with his Holy Spirit to walk in God's commandments. It's completely opposite. People tried so hard and they failed miserably, which was the plan all along. If you read Galatians, it said the law was just a guardian. It was just guardian so people would not worship the devil, demons or idols. So God put the, the, the guardrails to, to keep people from, from crossing that. And He would punish when they did. Well, when Jesus came or when faith came, we are justified and saved by faith. We enter into the new covenant by faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross. And we get cleansed by His holy blood. And His Holy Spirit renews our spirit. And the Bible says that His laws, the laws, you know, it comes in here. And that they're written on the tablets of our hearts. They become practical. You start living it. You start loving people, which people couldn't do before, because it takes God to love mm -hmm. God and people, right? The Holy Spirit, the love of God is filled into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, we generally don't like people. It takes God to like people, generally. I mean, some people are really loving, but there's that one guy that loves people. But I'm just talking about... <laughs> For the rest of us, right? We need God to love people. Uh, and it's supernatural. Nothing that you can, dunk, can do. It's, it's, it's not for, because of works. There's nothing you can attain. It's a free gift. It's like Jesus, like, I, it costs Jesus a lot. But for us, it's a free gift. And that's why it's, it's such a treasured possession. The Holy Spirit, it's a treasured possession. It's the biggest treasure you have now. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, Jesus says you cannot, he's not talking to the Jewish people, so you can't do both. When the Holy Spirit comes, you know, of course, he's talking about the times when, when he's going to die for their sins and be resurrected. He said you, you cannot keep going back to the old. You have to live in the new wine, in the Holy Spirit. You're going to love God, and you're going to love people, and it's supernatural. And it's a gift. Just walk in it. Just say yes to God. That's it. And then the Holy Spirit will, will help us to walk out every commandment. Because if you love God and you love people, you will fulfill the law. You already did. Because you love. Anyway, so that's kind of a, a short little exhortation on, the, on that verse. Or maybe not so short. Okay, so, um, so now, this is verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. 
And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees, again, I mean, they followed around, said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, they're uh, challenging Jesus. And again, to understand, for us, like, like, what's a big deal, right? Well, for them, it was a big deal. If you go back all the way to the law of Moses, you have to go back all the way to Leviticus, Deuteronomy, um, and Exodus. Uh, God commanded people, again, now remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. So he commanded to keep the Sabbath holy or set apart. He said, one day you must set apart for me. You must not do anything. So there, um, anything meant anything. In fact, he says you can't even go and gather manna because manna, you know, they would, you know, come. I said, there won't be manna. So you have to gather the day before, make sure there's no fires in your camps, and so all these things. Now, of course, the Jewish people, if you read through the, through the, you know, the, the kings, the four kings, you know that they disobeyed God, they start worshiping idols, and God dispersed them. So the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, came and he took them into captivity. And one of the reasons why he took up the captivity because they would break Sabbath and they would break Sabbath in two ways. They, they would work on Sabbath and on, a, you know, on a day of rest and the land would not rest. They would not let, uh, let the soil rest according to the law. So God said, okay, because you did that, the soil will rest for 70 years because 400 whatever years, they, they skipped that. They omitted that commandment to give the, the soil one year of not sowing anything and ripping. So, so when they come back from the so Babylonian captivity, Nehemiah, Ezra, they're like, we're not going to screw this up. We're really going to make sure we're going to do the Sabbath thing because this is why God you know, kicked us out of our land. Yeah. So for them, so you understand, for yeah. them it's important. Yeah. So... So when the Pharisees see something like this, like, like they're eating, I know they're picking, they're plucking, and they're eating, and they're like perplexed. I'm like, Jesus, I mean, this is, this is how can you do that? So that's why they're asking that question. They're very, very uh, upset about that. Well, see what Jesus replies. Verse 25, But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in the need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, in the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. So he talks about David. Now, David is their hero, all right? So David is their hero. So what happened to David? Well, David was running from Saul. Saul wanted to kill David. He was jealous of him, and let's just say he didn't like David, all right? To make it shorter. So David is running. He's on the run, has no sword, has no food. So he comes to a city where, uh, you know, where there was a tabernacle of Moses and there were priests. And he asked, probably knew Abathar, because remember, David served Saul. He went in and went out before Saul and he led troops and he did the, war, uh, the battles of the Lord. So, they, so Abathar knows who David is. He's a little perplexed. Why is David alone? Now, he doesn't know he's running from Saul. So David makes up a story. He said, yeah, we're in a secret mission from Saul. He, so he lies a little bit. And then he says, do you have anything to eat? Because he's very hungry. And Abathar said, well, we just have the showbread. Now, the showbread, they would leave out fresh bread on the, show, on the table you know, before, the, before, before the Holy of Holies. And they would change it. Repl you know, replenish it with, with another warm bread and the priest would eat the bread. It was holy. So he says like, well, I only have holy bread mm -hmm. and only the priest can eat it. And of course, David is, is from the tribe of Judah. He's not, into, he's not a Levite. He, I mean, he, not, not a priest for sure. So he says, well, you know, if you're really hungry, he can understand like David's starving, like he needs to eat. So he gives him some. So David eats. So he's telling him, remember that? Your hero David, how he broke the law? Mm -hmm. So they're tracking with him. Yeah. You know? Okay, so... And he said to them, he makes this point, 
the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He said, you miss the spirit of that law. He says the Sabbath is to help a person connect to God. This is the time when you go and bless people and help people and you spend time with your families and you teach the law of God and you talk about God and what He did for His people. It's not that you that you're a slave to the day because they were a slave to Sabbath. But He says that the Sabbath is supposed to serve the person. Completely backwards. So He says when David was hungry, you know, the lies, God is not like a, sits there with his staff and like, if you just break one line, he's trying to crush somebody. He's very merciful. He understands. Somebody's hungry and, um, you know, and he ate what he was not supposed to do. God does not hold people to those things because he understands humanity. He's very merciful. He's very kind. He always was kind. He was always merciful. Jesus was was nice in the Old Testament. People think like, well, God in the Old Testament is so mean, and then I kind of like the God of the New Testament. Jesus is so nice. Same God, same Jesus, all right? Different covenants, different agreements, but same God. He says that, that, that the Sabbath is for us. It serves us. We don't serve the day. God made it for us, to help us. Then he makes this declaration. I mean, I can imagine the Pharisees getting really upset about this one. He says, Therefore, the Son of Man, talks about himself, is also Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I am Lord of rest. Now, you have to go to the book of Hebrews to know that in the New Covenant, the actual fulfillment of Sabbath happens when we are born again. We enter his rest. Okay? It's rest on the inner man. That means that you are, you can come before God at any time, anywhere. You don't have to go to Jerusalem to pray. You don't have to go to a place where God appoints to worship Him. You can worship Him anywhere. And your soul is at peace. That's the true rest. Okay, now Sabbath was a foreshadow of the rest we were going to get in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the Lord of rest. I can only give you rest. So, so, you know, if you, if you work on the, on, if you have to work on Sabbath, um, you can still pray to God, worship Jesus, you know. It, it's the inner rest that you have entered. That is important. Some people still try to kind of, um, like if you go to, to Israel, they, even the, if you go on an um, elevator, the buttons, you can't even press the button. I went to, I was in Ukraine, and I went to um, uh, kind of like a synagogue just to kind of see how, the, how they were doing things, and it was like a tour, and so we were, at, on, uh, it was Saturday, and so we come in, and I'm like, the elevator just goes up by itself, like, what is going on here, you know? They said, yeah, you can't press buttons here. I'm like, why not? Well, it's Sabbath. I'm like, really? You couldn't push a button? No, you can't push a button. I'm like, hmm, all right, cool. I mean, I guess, I mean, if you guys got that figured out, yeah, right? So they would circumvent things, right? (laughs) But Jesus says, true rest and true Sabbath when you have peace on your inner man, when you are good with Jesus, right? right? Mm -hmm. This is a true rest. So so anyway, it says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. uh, Chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. Now they are now on him. They're trying to catch him. And they're following him again to catch him in, in the, that he would, be, like, he would break the law so they would accuse him uh, in front of people. So they watched him closely, verses 2. They watched him very closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. So, interesting scenario here. So they're watching him. Yeah. So they're trying to set him up at church, right? So this guy had a hand with their hand. Like yeah. the hand wasn't working. So, and Jesus knows. He's onto them. Like, they think they're trying to trick Jesus. He's onto He knows exactly what is going on. So they're like, okay, let's see if he's going to heal him on, on, on a day of rest, on Sabbath. So they watched him closely. Well, verse 3, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Like, hey, buddy, come here. I want to. So he's making an example. 
So these guys are watching him. It's like, okay, so you, so they can see better. Why don't you come a little bit closer, right? So, so the so the uh, Pharisees and the scribes can really see this happening. Now they're watching. They're watching him. It's like, and he's like, I'm on to you guys. I know what you're doing. Verse four. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? He's asking them a question. Is it good on the Lord's day to do good things? And they're stuck. I mean, if they say yes, then that would imply work. If he heals them and then... So they kept silent. Now this is interesting. Now now Mark, he uh, highlights, or the Holy Spirit through Mark highlights two emotions that Jesus had during this altercation. Very important. Let's kind of focus on them. And then he looked around at them. So he looked around in their eyes, in their faces, with anger. Jesus got angry. Now, you don't want to get Jesus angry. I mean, (laughs) one thing I've learned, um, Jesus is very kind, but you do not want to get him angry. right? Well, they don't know he's the Son of God. He's the Genesis 1 God. So, they don't know who they're dealing with, but he's angry. Being grieved. Now, he's angry and his heart is grieved at the same time. Well, why is, why is his heart grieved? Well, he, he grieved by the hardness of their hearts. Because their hearts were so callous. Like, this guy has no arm, basically. Yeah. He works with one arm. He goes to work and works. He has to do labor. It's not like there's welfare there, right? Yeah. He has to either beg or work. And, of course, he comes to church. And it makes total sense for mercy. Like, yeah. You know, pray, help the person because, because of his disability. But their hearts, they cared so much about the law. Their hearts were so hard. They could care less about that guy. They, they didn't care. Their sole purpose was at that point is to catch Jesus. They didn't even think that that guy had, you know, was probably poor, couldn't work, or had hard times. Could not care. They just wanted to catch, use the occasion to catch Jesus. And Jesus' heart was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. Now, he's angry and he's grieved. Now, he, it's, it's uh, leveled against the leadership, right? He's angry at the leaders of Israel because they are setting their, their teaching, because, you know, people are learning from the Pharisees that have their own kind of like students. They're teaching them hypocrisy and they're teaching them the hardness. Yeah. Like they're, they're, they're callous. They don't care about the person. They just, they just want to you know, make sure that they uh, perform all these rituals and they're very hard on people if they didn't. Well, of course, we'll read again how, how, how Jesus exposes that hypocrisy in them. But he is grieved. He's angry and he's grieved at the leaders that are using the Bible to, sh- to, to uh, beat people with, basically, if, in our language. They're using the very book that is to heal. They kill with it. And Jesus makes Jesus angry and grieved at the same time. Well, what does that mean? That means that the leaders that are using this beautiful, spiritual book to hurt a human soul yeah. will one day answer to the man yeah. that's fully God. And he's going to be angry. And at that time, and we read in, in the book of Revelation, that when they perceive him, they will see him, every eye will see him, from hell, under the earth, in caves. Every blind eye will open at his second coming. They, people will be terrified. Now, we will be excited, but people... They had resisted him, uh, they will be terrified. And the biggest thing, they will try to hide from his wrath. Because the time of his wrath has come. Jesus is very kind, yes. very generous. He is long suffering, which means he suffers long. Yes. He doesn't want anybody to perish. But when leaders persist in using the Bible to hurt the sheep, it makes Jesus angry. And it grieves his heart. That's the church where there is no Holy Spirit, but there's demonic influences. There's nothing good. 
Why? Because they're using the Bible to hurt the very people Jesus came to save and die for. It cost Jesus a lot to die for us. A lot. A lot of suffering. It didn't... The, the price of our salvation was bought with His own blood and sufferings. So it means a lot to the Father. And so um, for us, for, for me, I'm thinking like, God, I mean, I really want to have a soft heart. I don't want to become so legalistic, you know, so trying to prove my point. You know, if somebody disagrees with whatever, like say, well, you know, about rapture, when is it before, is it after? I mean, start arguing with people. Like those kind of things get my heart hard. When I start arguing with people and trying to prove something, that's how we get hard. I really want the Holy Spirit to really help us to use this beautiful word to heal people. Amen. Let's use this Bible to cast out devil. Let's hurt the devil with it. Yeah. It's a sword. It's a very potent sword. And let this bring healing to many, many broken lives and many, many broken hearts. And so, um, I don't know how much time I have. Five more minutes. So, Again, that, that when I was kind of going through that, praying this verse out, it really touched me, um, for sure, when I was talking to the Holy Spirit about this. Well, the man stretched out, I said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. It's a miracle. It's not progressive healing. It's instantaneous. It's like, it's like they, they watch it, like, like, grow back. I mean, like... <laughs> And no repentance there, like you, uh, you would think, right? You would fall down, oh, Lord, forgive me for hardness of heart. None. Well, let's see what they do. Well, he offended them so much. Again, he offends the mind to reveal the heart. Verse 6, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Now they're making a decision. That's the leaders of Israel. The spiritual leaders, leadership is making a decision to destroy this man from Galilee, to completely wipe him out, to kill him. So this, after this offense, God revealed their heart. It was full of hardness. They hated God. That was revealed. End of the day, they're preaching the law, but Jesus, by offending their mind, revealed that their heart, they hated God. And that's why they wanted to kill his son. It's very simple. We love God, we love his son. We hate his son, we hate God. Just the way it is, because Father loves Jesus very much, and Jesus loves his Father very, very much. Well, we're going to stop here and just pray and thank the Holy Spirit for teaching us from the Word of God. Holy Spirit, I, I'm just, I acknowledge your presence in this place, and I, I am so thankful, God, for the living understanding, God. I'm so thankful, Holy Spirit, that you have churned our hearts that were so hard. There were um, there was just so much religion, God, in our hearts and our minds, and you took that, God, and you broke that in us, and you healed us from that. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you revealed yourself to me as the tender God, as the merciful God, as the loving Father, because that's who you are forever, God. And I'm just so thankful, Jesus, that you are so compassionate, that you love people so much, that you went so low, that you would bring us up to you, God, that you would take us with you, Lord. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts. I ask that, that you would seal this word, Holy Spirit, on the tablets of our heart, that you would write them, God, that we would remember, make it the living understanding, God, all these words that you have spoken through Jesus. Amen. All right. Yeah. Wait, uh. somebody...